Hello and welcome to Amplified Voices, where we highlight Black voices around the world that are making an impact within their respective industries. My name is Debbie Alamru and I'm your host. In this episode, I sat down with actor Dayo Okeni, who you may know from Hunger Games, Terminator Genesis, and Shades of Blue. He's the lead actor in the movie Emperor, which just dropped digitally on August 18th. Emperor is a film inspired by the true story of legend Shields Green, a descendant of African kings turned outlaw slave in the pre-Civil War South. I talked to Dayo about how it felt landing his first lead role, what it took to get in character, and how COVID-19 affected the release of this film. So I'm curious to know, Dayo, what was it about the script that made you think this, this is the role for me? Um, you know, to be honest, when, when it initially came across my desk, uh, I wasn't too keen on it. You know, I kind of had this idea that, you know, the slave narrative, is this something that, you know, we want to, you know, perpetuate, mm-hmm. uh, you know, movie screens and television with now, I feel like we've moved past that. There are other more interesting stories that we should be telling. And honestly, in retrospect, in retrospect I was extremely wrong. Um, and you know, we filmed this movie, what, two years ago, 2018. So this was before you know, the turmoil that we experienced earlier this year with, you know, the killing of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and just, you know, the, the, the topic of race coming back to the social forefront. So, you know, when, when this happened in my naive mind, I somehow thought, Oh, we should be getting past this. You know, we should Mm. be. Um, But when I did more research on Shields Green, the actual Shields Green, it became apparent to me that there are a lot of stories that take place within that civil war slavery era that seriously need to be told. I think, yeah. you know, the heavy hitters, we've heard about them, the Harriet Tubman's, yep. the Frederick Douglass's. And so for me, it was about, you know, who is this guy? Why is he unknown? And why don't we know more about him? And whenever we hear about the civil war era, or we hear about, you know, the ending of slavery and the emancipation, um, we, we don't know that it was a domino effect or rather we forget that it was a domino effect. There were a lot of people that made a lot of little sacrifices along the way. And if you akin it to the Black Lives Matter movement today, you know, there were a lot of young black men that were killed at the hand of police, but George Floyd was the straw that broke the camel's Mm -hmm. back. So the story of Shields Green is just one of those dominoes along the way. And the raid on Harper's Ferry, which a lot of people call the dress rehearsal for the civil war, you know, um, or the spark that was that that a lot of people attributed as the spark that started the Civil War, right. um, the raid of Harper's Ferry with John Brown. Um, when when I was able to wrap my head around that concept, I was like, okay, cool. This is a movie that I can get behind. This is a character I can get behind. Um, and just from a selfish protagonist point of view, he's a character that doesn't wait for a white savior. Yes. You know what I'm saying he's he takes agency of his own life, and that was something that I. I was like, okay, you know, you want to, you want to see, okay, what is it that Roots has done? What is it that 12 Years a Slave has yeah. done? What is it that A Birth of a Nation has done? And how does this separate in one way or another? So um, there were just a lot of things in there that I thought I could use to make my own. And, and once I wrapped my head around it, I was like, okay, I'm going to do everything in my power to, yeah. to, to play this character the best that I possibly could. Yeah, no, I love that. I think when I watched the movie, I think that's what really stuck out to me because, you know, I've I've watched a lot of slave slavery movies. Um, yeah. but this, it's like, it didn't focus on the trauma the slaves endured. It didn't yeah. focus on white saviors either. And I think that the very, very first line of the movie stood out to me. And that was, it's time for a black man to tell his own story. And right. I think that is like the thread that holds the whole film together. Um, mm. So what did you, in playing this character, what did you learn about yourself? Oh, man. You know, there's so many different things. I think sometimes people forget that as an actor, right, there are two lives that you live when you're making a movie. There's the actual process of making the movie Mm -hmm. and loving that process in itself. And then there's the other aspect of making a movie, which is the the finished product and reliving those experiences that you went Mm -hmm. through while making the movie and then watching other people's reaction of the movie. It's like a... There, there are multiple things to fall in love with, but I particularly love the process of making the film. Mm. And it's an extremely spiritual process for me. You know, I'm a very spiritual individual and making a movie, you always learn something about yourself for good or for bad. You know, right. example, I remember I, I would, I would mock actors that always said, oh, it took me, you know, it took me like a year to, to shake off a character. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Bro? Yeah. Like, 
just go get an in and out burger. You'll be back to the 21st <laughs> century in no time. Yeah. Right? And, I, and I would always, because I was, I'm not really a method actor. I'm not somebody to, you know, completely delve into a character. But for the very first time on this movie, I was like, no, it, it's going to require that. So it was like, you know, doing literally everything, trying to eat like 800 calories a day, which is roughly what, you mm-hmm. know, slaves ate a day, like uh, changing my body, changing the way I walked and, and studying yeah. like trauma and how children who've gone through trauma, you know, tend to not have good eye contact, even as adults or broken up speech patterns, you know, they tend to develop a stutter of some kind. And I remember in Frederick Douglass's book, when he talked about Shields Green, he said Shields was a man of very few words and he spoke in very precise and broken, in a, in a very precise and broken up pattern. So all these things kind of inform what trauma does to the brain. And I was just really trying to get into that mental space and um, because there's really no experience on earth today that can truly recreate what it, what it means right. to be a slave. I mean, other than killing somebody and going to prison for the rest of my life, which I'm not going to do that for a role. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, so there were all those things I tried to do. And, and I remember after wrapping the film, I had nightmares for like two months straight, like three wow. months straight, like that I was being chased in my dream. <laughs> And I was like, whoa, like that's, wow. that's serious. And it was like a lot of meditation and, you know, I had to go on vacation. Like there were a lot of things I had to do to just break wow. that mental cycle because in research, what I found out was, you know, there's a part of the subconscious that doesn't, it can't separate real from fake, mm-hmm. right? That's why we, that's why we worry about the future. We worry about things that are intangible, that aren't real. Mm-hmm. That same part of the brain, when you're on set and there's a white actor screaming nigga and yeah. whipping you and all, yeah, your conscious mind knows it's not real, but there is a part of your subconscious that has no idea that can't separate that trauma. And we shot for what, 45 50 days and so when you're constantly in that state of mind on the run on the run yeah when I was done with the movie I found myself like constantly on edge and like waking up like in cold sweat and all this stuff so yeah it definitely definitely (laughs) you channeled the character definitely more than any character I've ever played in my life and then Uh you know if anything it just helped my process of you know if you're going to go the method route don't just dive into it slowly Mm -hmm. ease yourself into it I went cold turkey so it was like diet exercise you know cut off all my friends that summer like I was very much trying to And it's like no when you want to go into character you go into it slowly you stick into it and then it's a easing off process even after filming so these are just other things that I learned but um but about myself I mean then then there's the career side of me so there's the artistic side what I learned about myself artistically but then there's the career side which is just um the confidence to to carry a picture you know I've never been the lead of a movie before and um, it sounds like a dream that every actor would just easily have and something that we all just feel like we have the power to do. But it's yeah. one thing to dream about it. And it's another thing to find yourself in that situation. And like, if you don't come to set every day, all too prepared, mm-hmm. the, the film is at stake, you know? And I definitely learned a lot about myself, about being a leader and being on set and keeping the morale of the, of the crew high. You know, there's also yeah. that other side of it, which is just making sure that there is a healthy work environment on set while we were filming was when the whole me too thing was going on. And I just wanted to make sure like everybody's taken care of on set. Nobody feels like, you know, I I tend to listen, I started a company called positive vibes only. So on on set, we had to just maintain, like, we're not going to be one of those sets where we hear some crazy story about where things like that taking place. So it was about doing that and staying focused and all that stuff. And I just really felt, empowered by our producers, you know, Reggie Hudlin and our director, Mark Ammon and Cami Winnikoff and everybody at Sobini and mm-hmm. Briar Cliff Universal that know, like, you're in the right place. You make yeah. the right decision. You are, you are, you can carry a picture. And so that's something that's, um, I mean, that's huge because that, that, that moment drives the rest of your career, you know. Absolutely. Now, you mentioned um, that you read a Frederick Douglass book and it had a little bit about yeah. Shields Green in it. Now, I'm going to mm-hmm. be completely honest. I had never heard this name before I watched this picture. Um, yeah. So I don't think there's a lot of information out there about him. So what was the most challenging part about capturing the essence of his character? Right. Um, It's tough. You know, there's a gift and a curse to that, right? Mm -hmm. The gift is he's someone people don't know. So you can take a lot of creative liberties. Mm -hmm. You 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 can be just purely true to how you see yourself in the shoes of that character, as opposed to, you know, Jimmy Fox playing somebody like Ray Charles, where we all know what Ray Charles looked like, how he talked, how he walked. So there's a lot of pressure to 
to get that okay. right. Um, and then there are other biopics that have come out, you know, something like The Social Network, where, you know, Jesse Eisenberg is not exactly being Mark Zuckerberg, but he, he's being so authentic to the character mm. that Aaron Sorkin wrote and not the person. And if you do that strongly enough, people will, it's another way to, to endear the audience into the character. Mm. So if anything, I just took that route. You know, I just said, okay, there is very, very little information about the guy. No known living relatives that I could find in my research. So there wasn't anybody I could go talk to or anything like that. So it was just about trying to find news clippings about the the raid on Harper's Ferry, um, some fringe information that he might have had a wife and he might have had a son, which our movie, we took that and ran with it. Um, And then roughly gauging or estimating what his age would be. Um, And then just trying to build a character literally from scratch, you know, and um, for me, it was just really about being an African myself and Shields character being somebody who they said, you know, was descended from slaves. I'm sorry, he was descended from African royalty or believed to be a descendant of African royalty because of the way he walked and the way he carried himself. And he somewhat ran the plantation that he was on, which was very rare, extremely rare for that time it starts to conjure up an image in your mind just yeah. naturally of like, what is, who is this guy, you know, kind of the thing. And, and it's a bit controversial, but you know, there are people who have issues with an African playing this role. And uh, to me, it makes honestly no sense because we all come from the Serengeti, you know what I'm saying? I think one of the greatest lies that has been told to African Americans is that their story started from slavery. Yeah. And the story goes way before that. And, you know, Africa has a rich history prior to slavery. And that's another thing that drew me to the character because I'm here in this country and I'm sure there are people who see me and maybe because of the way I talk or the way I walk or whatever, they go, oh, this guy is not African-American. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So um, I think that's something that endeared me to that character, which is somebody who is with us, but he seems foreign. Somebody who seems like something we know, but he's different. Not yeah. to say Africans are better than African American. Please don't get me wrong yeah. or mistaken. But it's just that otherness that right. you know, you walk into a room and it's something is just different about this guy. And so that that was another thing that was just very interesting to me. And I know I've had my identity crisis. I'm 32 right now. Mm-hmm. And I moved to America when I was 15. So technically now I've lived in America longer when I lived in Nigeria growing up. Yeah. So then you start battling these things within yourself of like, am I American now? Am I still Nigerian? If, you know, my accent has naturally faded over time a little bit, should I fight to keep my Nigerian accent? Yeah. So these are things that I try to bring to Shield's character. If your mother, if you're on a plantation mm-hmm. and your mother, you grew up with your mother telling you you're descended of African royalty and, you know, there's just a, a natural... Um, you don't fear authority the way you feel like the other slaves around mm-hmm. you fear authority. Like, you know, I'm sure he too dealt with all that stuff. You know, there's a part in the movie where John Brown's character asks him, he's like, you know, uh, that, you know, they say you're descended from African royalty. Is it true? And Shields kind of just tells him, you know, father, son, emperor, slave, it's all the same to me. Like, we're all just people. I'm just trying to make my way yeah. in this world. And so as an actor, like, you know, slaves are descendant of Africans. And if I'm an African playing a slave, I feel like I have somewhat of a right or somewhat of a, at least an opportunity to play that role. I'm going to try and play it as honestly as possible because the DNA is still there. The thread is still there. You know what I'm saying? So, um, yeah. so yeah, it's him being from royalty. It's such a complicated, complex thing, but okay. I try to let that inform the character as much as possible, but not to be a caricature or not to be fake with it. You know, sometimes, sometimes I'm sorry if I'm rambling on and on, but I get passionate about this, but it's like sometimes in the social justice warrior era that we tend to be in right now, people just want, they want to tell that story, but they want the slave to be this fucking superhero, this guy who's like defied authority. And that is just not the truth. It, yeah. in, in, at least for me, in my way of seeing the world, courage to me is being absolutely terrified. I mean, being traumatized, terrified, but doing the yeah, right I thing mm-hmm. anyway. And yeah. so in playing him as in playing him as somebody who had authority or somebody who 
you know, they called him emperor because of the way he carried himself. You have to know what that what that definition of carrying yourself would be in the 1800s, right? Like, right. oh, he, 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 the way he carried himself, he, he carried himself like royalty. For us, that would be like Jay-Z and Hove. But for <laughs> yeah. back then, right. it would just be a slave who made a little bit more eye contact than the next mm-hmm. person. A slave yeah. who wasn't afraid to, even like in the movie, when we get the new slave masters, he walks up mm. to Beaumont and he's like, I, I run things around here and I'm the, the way it's written in the script, it's very easy to play that part and walk up with confidence and say, yeah, my name is Shields and I, I run things around here. And I was very adamant with our director, Mark. I'm like, yeah. we don't have, he should play it timid. He should play it a little bit afraid because him just yeah. doing it anyway, is that's huge. what makes him yeah. emperor. That's huge. Yeah. So don't feel the need to make him this hero. Don't feel the need to make him this large in life character. Just yeah. play him as... You know, he looks around for, right, he looks around for a moment and all the other slaves walk away and he, and he just, I'm going to do it anyway. And that's, I mean, it still gives me chills till today, but, but that's the part that excited me about him was like, how do you play strength in the most quiet way possible? I love Because back then it spoke volumes. So this film was scheduled for release in theaters on March 20th. Now, that yes. was literally just days before the country went on lockdown due to the COVID-19 yes. pandemic. Now, what was your initial thought when you realized that people weren't going to be able to watch this film on the big screen? You know, I, I kind of gave up expectations just in general in my life a very long time ago. Like, I okay. firmly believe in living in the now. And so to say I wasn't disappointed would be a lie, obviously. Mm-hmm film is television is television film is film and and i think the greatest expression of film is on a big screen you know when you share a film with a with a with, with a, a room full of people there's just a synergy you you mm-hmm. literally become one organism and the, the, you absorb a movie in a different way mm-hmm. and i really do wish that we had the chance to to sh- exhibit the movie that way but obviously yeah covid happened and the pandemic kind of did what it was going to do. And we're not a big studio film, you know, we're not like right. Tenet where we could just, yeah. oh, we'll, we'll release it next year. Like we, yeah. we spent our, our marketing dollars, you know what I'm saying? So the movie has to come out. So, um, but ultimately I do think the story or rather getting people to educate themselves on Shields is more important on ultimately than mm-hmm. any of that other stuff. So the fact that it's just out and that yeah. Universal was able to pick us up and put it out is incredible to me alone. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really a, a true believer in everything happens for a reason and everything mm-hmm. happens exactly the way it was supposed to happen. Yeah. There are no hypotheticals. There are no ifs, buts, and maybes. We find ourselves in the realities that we've created for ourselves and we just have to be grateful in every circumstance that we find ourselves in. And that's what I truly 100% believe. And so I am grateful and proud that the movie came out exactly yeah. the way it has come out. And it's interesting because you said when you filmed it two years ago, of course, you yeah. know, racial tensions in this country have been going on and have never disappeared. Yeah. But ultimately, mm-hmm. the state of the country right now, I feel like this film being released on a digital platform, it's available to and accessible to a much larger audience. And it's Definitely. so extremely relevant. I think people are actively and intentionally looking for stories of strong, powerful Black people. So, yeah. you know, I hope that, that this is something that they'll watch, you know? I do. I, I yeah. truly, truly hope so. You know, my, my, <laughs> my sister sent me a video of her and my niece is watching it. And to just Aww. see, it, it, it honestly it almost broke me for them to go, oh my God. Like, they were, listen, they were on set. They visited me in Savannah while I was making this movie. Oh, wow, okay. But children sometimes don't, till they see it yeah. on a screen. They're not putting it together. Yeah, they're not putting it together. Oh yeah, Uncle Dio's an actor. Da, 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 da. Yeah. But like, she filmed them and like, when I came up, she was like, oh my God, is Uncle Dio. And like, she's laughing like, Aww. yeah, who do, you, who do you think it was gonna be? Like, you think it was gonna be somebody <laughs> else? To, so even just for them to see, you know, black people portrayed that way on screen yeah. in a powerful way. Mm-hmm. And luckily, I mean, she, she knows me. So it's it, the, the degree of separation from her uncle to her is right there. Yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure that just conjured up a bunch of different possibilities in her mind of what she could be or what she could do. So those are the things that give me the most joy, honestly, Uh, like, you know, to, to bring something into this world that can empower people. Yeah. I love that. All right. Now I don't want to spoil the movie for anyone that hasn't seen Mm -hmm. it yet, 
but sir, I saw you with your little 007 moment. I don't want to say what that was, but you had a little 007 moment at the, towards the end. Yes, you did. So, oh, okay. Yes. Okay. So your yeah. dream, oh, I see what you're dream saying, yeah. lead role, what would it be? My what? What lead role? Dream lead role. What would it be? Dream lead role. You know, I find that so hard. I, I'm, I'm, I hate being one person to covet something before it's mine. Like, I just feel like- You're manifesting. Like, you can manifest it though. But to, but to manifest, you know, I don't, I don't particularly, you know, I come from the school of variety. You know, I come okay. from the school of being able to play anything and everything from something as serious as Shields Green to something as funny as like a Bad Boys Jerry Brockheimer movie to okay. something as amazing and huge as like a Marvel movie. I mean, being in Black Panther, Yes. Being in Marvel in any way would be the one of the biggest dreams of my life. Okay. But I, I, but in order to have that varied career, you have to be educated on filmmakers. And so filmmakers are the people that turn me on the most because if you're working with a Jordan Peele or if you're working with a Ridley Scott or if you're working with Quentin Tarantino, you work with Ava DuVernay, mm -hmm. Ryan Coogler, I can name people yeah, from now to the end of time. Chances are, if you can work with these people over the course of your career, you will have a varied career and you mm. will have a diverse and interesting mix of, of different things to do. But like, yeah, I've, I've never been, I've never been particular on any one character or like, oh, I want to play this before I die or whatever. I'm not right. that kind of person. Like, uh, I, you know, one of my favorite filmmakers, Shauna Festi, she's cast me in a bunch of different things. We have a movie next year. It came out this year. It went to Sundance, but because of COVID, it's moving to next year. It's called Run, Sweetheart, Run. And Shauna is one of those directors. And then we have a podcast that came out called Dirty Diana. And I voice a character. It's like a, a audio drama with Demi Moore. Okay. And a bunch of people, Lena Dunham. It's a big, big cast. And Shauna is one of those people where she's always asked me to play something that no one ever asked me to play in my career. Yeah. Like from Endless Love, which was a universal movie I did with her a few years back. And now we have Run, Run Sweetheart Run coming out next year, which is a completely different departure from Shields. I mean, my character in that is despicable and that's oh. and that's a and that's high praise for him right so wow. um so yeah you know filmmakers like that that actually see something in you that you might not see in yourself and they're able to get you to stretch and play different things you know oh uh is i i, I like that because sometimes you can have an idea of what you think your career should look like but you're bigger than that or you're more yeah. You, you have more range than that. And so sometimes being locked in on one thing can actually be a hindrance to That's your career. You should do point. things that challenge you, that scare you, you know? Yeah, yeah. I love that. All right, so now just lastly, uh, where can people watch Emperor? Anywhere you buy digital films. Hey, you can go to Target right now and pick up a DVD. It's on yeah. the shelves. So yeah, it's, I mean, Apple, Amazon, uh, Google Play, literally wherever you can purchase or rent a digital download, Emperor will be there waiting for you to rent. It's not expensive. I think it's $5. It is, yeah. Everybody got $5. You know what I'm saying? You just, had a, you just got to skip Starbucks for one day and you're good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, but yes, I think it's out there and, you know, we would definitely love it if you checked it out and yeah. you know, support awesome. it. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time, Dio. It was a pleasure speaking thank with you. you and I hope that this movie elevates into much success and good luck with everything coming to you in your career. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All Have right. Thank Africa. you. Shout out. Thank <laughs> you. Bye. <laughs>